Hey, welcome to the Data Driven Real Estate Podcast, episode 14. We are thrilled to have with us today, Doug Duncan, Chief Economist of Fannie Mae. He does the analysis and forecast for the economy and the housing and mortgage markets. Duncan also oversees the strategic research regarding the potential impact of external factors on the housing market, and he leads the House Price Forecast Working Group, which reports to the Finance Committee. He's named one of the Bloomberg and Business Week's 50 most powerful uh, people in real estate. And today we talk about everything from impacts of COVID-19 to his forecast on the economy and the data that they're you're watching to stay out of politics and really focus on what's ahead for real estate and how real estate is actually one of the bright spots. We talk about how low interest rates can go and the likelihood, the likelihood of foreclosures moving forward. You'll definitely want to tune in this week. Hey, welcome to the Data Driven Real Estate Podcast, a podcast for real estate professionals dedicated to driving business using data. I'm Aaron Norris. We've got the co-host of with uh, uh, Sean O'Toole with Property Radar, and we are so excited today to welcome the chief economist of Fannie Mae, Doug Duncan. Duncan, how you doing? I am doing well. Thanks for inviting me. Glad to see you guys again. Uh, I've, uh, I guess I've missed our annual get together at the uh, at the fundraiser, but good to see. You. I survive real estate. I know Dad interviewed you recently, and uh, you, we miss it too. We're we're coming up with a, a, something different this year, but uh, hopefully back next year. But what are you going to do? COVID nineteen has yeah. just ruined everything. There you go. <laughs> I wanted to start by asking you: Can you talk a little bit about the economic and strategic research group within? Is that strategic, strategically positioned within Fannie Mae? Um, yes, we. Uh, I, I think of it as a. A kind of a small holding company at the corporate level. So it does, we do coordinate corporate strategy uh, and that's uh, like eight or nine people. We have a forecast team that takes input from almost all of the staff, but is uh, probably about four staff or five, if you include me. Um, then we have a multifamily research team, which is five or six people. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have a a survey team of four or five people. And we have an industry analysis people. So altogether, we're somewhere 40 or around 40 people. So it's a little bit of an unusual chief economist job. Most corporate chief economists will have five to 15 people, depending on the size of the organization. Um, so they've, um, for whatever reason, put together a, a kind of a broader team. And we w- one of the things that they expect to get out of it uh, is thought leadership. In other words, thinking about things ahead of others that um, that might become important. And probably the biggest issue there is the whole supply question, which we started discussing way back in uh, late 2013 into early 2014, and now has been the mantra in the housing industry for uh, at least three or four years. So, so it's a lively, fun group of uh, people that uh, bring a lot of th- ideas to the table and toss them around, and uh, it's all all solid. A lot of fun. Outside of thought leadership, what would be like some practical things that uh, you know might impact consumers or other folks that would come out of your group and then get formed into you know some sort sure. of policy of Fannie Mae. I'll give you the most recent um, thing, which is uh, still uh, in many ways under discussion, early discussion in the industry. But four years ago, I went around the company and I asked the question, what do we know about the share of affordable housing in the United States that's at risk of flooding at any point in time? Turns out we knew very little about it because the responsibility for the placement of flood insurance rests with the servicer. So at the company, we really didn't know much. And so we started some research into that and have now, we have a body of uh, research that talk, that understands broadly where flood is within natural hazards. It's, it's actually 80% of losses from uh, natural disasters um, and some sense of where it is important. And we've run some experiments with catastrophic risk assessment firms to try to get an understanding of the science behind how those things are measured. There's a long ways to go, uh, but we've uh, handed it more into the policy making arena these days. And there's nothing formal yet, but um, that's an example of uh, where we where we got started. Now, would that could that at some point? I don't even know if this is possible. Like at, at that, at some point, could that? end up with Fannie Mae saying we won't lend in these areas um, because of, of flood risk or, you know, what would be the ultimate outcome there? 
Well, I think the question is, what does the insurance business, where are the gaps in insurance? <clears throat> because, for example, in Harvey, the hurricane that hit Houston, a high percentage of the flood damaged properties were not in the National Flood Insurance Program flood zones. And so whether an individual household had flood insurance or not was really not a mandated issue uh, because it wasn't within the National Flood Insurance Program. So it's, it's not so much that Fannie Mae will issue orders, but rather that the entire industry well, and consumers will have to come to terms with the, the changes in risks in that area. Interesting. <laughs> For for a homeowner that doesn't just to just finish up on this and then we'll move on. But uh, for a homeowner that doesn't carry you know flood insurance, which I think is unfortunately probably a lot, um, mm -hmm. you know, and they suffer a catastrophic loss, but they have a a loan on that. Does 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 Fannie have like some overriding flood insurance that helps protect them, or would they if if that homeowner didn't choose that insurance would Fannie ultimately suffer that loss. We, the, the, what I found out when I did my initial investigation was those places where we had information on flood was where the loss to the homeowner led to a foreclosure. And so we got involved in the, in the credit side of things. Um, but if you, uh, if you have take out a mortgage on a property that is in the flood zone, you must have national flood insurance um, right. on that. That is a requirement. Cool. I've always been very fascinated with you and your work and you operate in political spheres, but somehow you're able to stay out of politics. How do you do that? <laughs> well, um, part of it is um, having grown up in a, in a family where politics really didn't affect things. It's whether you got your work done. Um, uh, that was a farm and you didn't eat if you didn't work. So um, it, it, my family was not a particularly political family. I mean, they voted, they, they were responsible citizens and all that, but that wasn't what drove the, the, um, the interest. More so it was, how's the community doing? What, what's our role in the community? Are we, are we participating appropriately? Um, how do we help people, um, very much a church going family, that kind of thing. So I don't, uh, um, I like people, but I'm, I'm a kind of an introvert personally, but I, I like people and I like working with people, sharing ideas with people, that kind of thing. And, and political, yes, if you work in Washington, there's politics all around you, but you don't necessarily have to. You have to be aware of it, but you don't have to play in that in that arena to get things done. You're you're in it, but not of it. I like it. All right. <laughs> what does it look like when? So, do you guys, all forty of you, sort of get in a room and decide like, what's the coolest data that we can go after? Uh, how do you? What's the genesis of your process of starting new projects? Oh boy, we um, there's two or three sources. Uh, one is. Uh, for example, in the middle of the 2007-9 crisis, Tim Myopoulos, our CEO, and I were on an elevator, and he looked at me and he said, you know, he said, do we know who in our portfolio has a loan that's eligible for HARP and hasn't taken it up? That's a data request, right? So I said, I don't, but I don't know why we wouldn't. And so we, we then uh, identified all the loans in the portfolio that were eligible for HARP, and we contacted all the people through a survey and asked them, why haven't you taken it up? Man, did we learn a bunch of things, all kinds of misimpressions, uh, not understanding the program offerings, all kinds of things. By the time we were done with that and recast the communications on that, we brought about three quarters of a million more people into the HARP program. So that's one one source, somebody asks a question, it, it begs for data. Another one might be that we're working on a project. We had decided at the outset of this supply discussion, it's possible that we're setting rules that would inhibit the development of supply. For example, if you're thinking about a condo building, we have rules about the occupancy rate that has to be there before we would offer financing. So one of the questions was, does that rule have merit 
or should we actually change that because we're inhibiting the growth of supply? So that became a data question. We dived into research on condos in the background. Did you guys answer request- that one? Pardon? Did you get to an answer on that one? We did. We changed not on, I, I don't know that it was the share that had to be uh, sold, but we did change some rules uh, on condos uh, to, to uh, improve the uh, financing possibilities. Um, Another uh, uh, situation might be that a lender calls us. And uh, for example, uh, uh, we had, uh, have had both lenders and reporters that have called and said, is there evidence that the uh, COVID is leading people to exit the urban core? And what do you think will happen to house prices as a result? Well, that's a request for data. So we're, we're investigating that at present, and we can see clearly in at least four metropolitan areas that is a factor, but you also have to adjust for the fact that the millennials were already moving out of the urban core starting three or four years ago. So the question is, is it an accelerator of a trend that already existed, or is it driven by a new set of factors? That's a data question, right? Yeah. So those are three different angles at which data comes at us. And sometimes we're just sitting and thinking about things and saying, yeah, I wonder if there's data available to answer this question that we thought of ourselves. When do you think you'll have the answer to that, uh, that question on the uh, exits from the urban areas? We're, we're getting pretty close. Um, what we're confident in saying that San Francisco, New York, it's, it's pretty clear there's a, there's a, a trend there that didn't exist uh, pre-COVID. Um, it looks like Boston, Chicago might have similar characteristics. Um, I would say within the month, we'll, we'll say something more formal uh, because we're, it takes us a little time to work through the data in each of the metro areas. Um, now, that- will, you, will you only do that to the metro area or will you be able to dive down and say, okay, you know, within New York, right? the single family residential, the low density residential, it's not happening, but the high, densi- high density, high rise residential, it is happening. Or at that level, or is it more at the MSA level? Well, right now it's at the MSA level, but we, we have an interest in knowing it at below the MSA level because you know we finance properties all across most metropolitan areas, both single family and multifamily. Right. One of the interesting things in the multifamily side that we've been looking at is lease renewals. So in, and you know, you divide multifamily into A, B, and C, where A is the higher income, B is middle income, and C is lower income. Lease renewals in B and C properties are maintaining the, the same pace, but they've fallen in the A properties. So when we looked into that, what's going on is those are the people who are most likely to have the resources to buy a house or at least to relocate. So people are canceling or letting their leases expire in A properties and moving out. We can see that they're moving to less densely populated area, either buying or renting, which leaves an elevated vacancy rate in those A properties that generates reductions in rents so if you want to stay in that urban center, but want to lease an A property, you might drop your lease and take a discounted lease in another property. So it's a little bit of a, a musical chairs exercise because one segment of borrowers is opting out. So that that's, appears to be one of the dynamics that's underway in some of the submarkets. Do you and uh, Freddie Mac and the other... Uh the entities that you know do federally backed mortgages. Do you, do you all work together, or do you just have the coolest game in town? <laughs> well, there's a lot of inter, a lot of interaction. Uh, obviously, with Fannie and Freddie, uh, we we are coordinated on many things by the regulator FHFA, um, and there's obviously communication between the different regulators, the the um, FHA uh, and Ginny May and HUD. Uh, and there's some policy coordination across those uh, groups as well. Um, and the banking regulators uh, get involved in that conversation. In terms of the, the business community, there's lots of uh, conversations that are between various companies. In fact, one of, the, one of the impacts of the COVID has been the reduction 
in interpersonal communication between companies at conferences and things. It's, as you know, it's much more difficult to get all the nuances of communication online. And so there is something that's missing in that sense. Um, and there's a lot of coordination of, of, uh, of economists on, on issues. Um, and most all the, the chief economists who are involved in housing talk to one another frequently. Uh, whether it's um, talking about research issues or market conditions or things like that, there's there's a lot of uh, co- conversation on on issues in that space. Speaking of market conditions, I know that's probably the thing that folks listening want to hear the mm-hmm. most about. You know, can you walk us through a little bit? You know, what's happened from March to today, and then kind of what you. What take is on what happens over the next, you know, 12 months, two years, and, you know, what some of the variables are there that, uh, you know, could change that? Sure. Um, well, it's always, um, it, it was the case when I first was named chief economist and something I, I, at the mortgage bankers, I had to think about it for a little bit because I had to get used to the idea of being wrong. <laughs> because people are expecting a point forecast, and the best you can do is give them a range. Uh, so once I got comfortable with that, then you have to you have to decide what things you think are important, and they change from time to time because the different sectors of the economy ebb and flow, and all of that. So um, in March, when the COVID really hit, we changed our language a little bit, and we said. What are the drivers of this shock to the economy? The main one was a disease, which is not an economic phenomenon. It has economic impacts, but it's not an economic variable. So your model will not have the disease in it. So we said, well, what what effect does the disease have? Well, it affects people's behavior, which affects businesses' behavior, and businesses make choices, and then that affects policymaker behaviors, which constrain the behaviors of people and businesses, right? So there is that, that's the environment in which the, the, the economic momentum is going to be affected. And what's, what are the drivers? It's the incidence, uh, mor- um, uh, morbidity, and uh, duration of the disease the severity and the uh, the incident severity and duration of the disease. Those are the things that are going to drive what happens uh, to economic activity. None of those, again, economic variables. So then, so what we said at the, at the April board of directors meeting, it was, we said, look, what we see now is our base scenario because we're really not talking about forecasting because forecasting assumes a pre-existing set of relationships between economic variables, but this is being driven by something outside that system. So really what we're doing is designing scenarios, which we hope to improve as time passes and then eventually get back into the forecast phase. So that was the first step. So then we ran some scenarios um, and those were used in stress testing the company's performance because we needed to understand how that was likely to impact our company and therefore what we do for the market. Um, And surprise to the board, we came back and said, house prices are gonna rise. And they said, what? (laughs) And we said, well, we're also, as you know, since June of 2010, we've been surveying a thousand households a month and we've found some really useful information in what people do. And right now, the people who have a home that they could offer for sale are more pessimistic than the people who could be in a position to buy a home because of these very low interest rates. So supply is going to drop faster than demand. And when the curves shift that way, price goes up. So activity will fall, but price will go up. And they said, well, we'll see. (laughs) So now we've seen, and that's exactly what has happened. So the, the fact that rates fell and then the Fed brought it down even further and now is buying $40 billion of mortgage-backed securities a month, all of that has led to rock bottom, historically low mortgage rates, which met the demand of 
the of the millennials who are largely salaried workers and most of the job loss has been in hourly wage earning service workers who tend to be renters so if you're still employed there was an initial phase in the april time frame when activity really dropped as everybody was waiting to see what's going to happen to our job most of the job loss was in the hourly wage earner space because it was service sector discretionary spending by middle and higher income households, which they simply curtailed. So those jobs went away, restaurants, theaters, concerts, sporting events, airplanes, hotels. That's all discretionary spending by middle and above uh, income households. But the workers there are hourly wage workers. So we said, when these salaried workers get confident, they look at those low interest rates. This is like a lifetime opportunity to buy a house and lock in a very low interest rate. And that's exactly what happened. So today's numbers that uh, came out in terms of new home sales passed a million. That was a, a, that was a full quarter ahead of what our forecast was. We, we have been trying to catch up to the pace of growth. And I, I told my staff this morning, I, every so often, uh, my nervous gene gets tweaked and <laughs> When my nervous gene gets tweaked, then we start digging into some data, which we've kind of been taking for granted. It's been a couple of years since we revisited the, the uh, housing production numbers relative to the demographic profile of the population. So it's time to take a look and see if they are aligned or if we're going to be getting ahead of ourselves um, in terms of the supply demand balance. If when People who own an existing home become more confident they can offer it for sale and for whatever purposes, then that supply metric picks up. If we're building like crazy at the same time, there could become uh, some possible overbuild. I don't think it's there, but I want to be sure. And I'm a little nervous because the monetary stimulus is so strong in this space that it could uh, build some uh, imbalances uh, and and lead to trouble. I don't like I say I don't think we're there, but I want to be I want to be more confident of that statement. I, and I think there's also on that right just that piece, and I think there's more to get back to here on the economy, but on the supply demand, right? With the and maybe I'm a little California biased here, but most of the new supply coming on market is, you know, if you think about that ABC, it's really at that upper middle class range yep. um, versus, you know, anything close to affordable uh, housing. So I could see a, an oversupply at the upper end. I think mm -hmm. we're at real risk of that, but man, we are, it, it, it doesn't feel, like if all the sources and all the king's men on it, we could get to an oversupply affordable housing anytime soon, at least out our direction. Uh, I'm in agree with you, agreement with you. That's um, it is difficult to build profitably uh, low income eligible housing. Um, California is probably the poster child uh, in that space. So I, you know, like I say, I, it's just my nervous gene, uh, and I, I agree with you about the distribution of supply. One of, one of the issues on that front is you've seen savings rates in the in the economy have skyrocketed. They're down a bit. They, they rose uh, in the second quarter to something like thirty two percent annualized, where a norm is six to eight percent. It's still over twenty percent. Wow. And I'll Starbucks guarantee coffees add up. <laughs> <laughs> well, my wife came into me and she said, "Have you looked at the checkbook lately? Where'd all that money come from?" <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Well, that's like where didn't it go?" <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. I said that's the benefit. That's the counterbalance to me being home all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so I don't think that those savings are evenly distributed. They're more in the, because it was the discretionary spending of higher income households that got curtailed. That's where more of those savings are. So they're active in the housing market, repositioning themselves, which is why you see those numbers at the higher end of the home sales numbers where they are. Uh, that's that's a, a piece of that. And many of those will lock in the last mortgage they ever have. Um, so you touched 
dug in on housing. Talk about the uh, like larger economy, you know, jobs and um, you know the health of small business and and some of that. I know you pay attention to those broader economic indicators too. So just you know, from March to today, kind of where do we stand, big picture, you know, GDP, those things. Well, if you if you go back to our uh, the rationale for this this for the, your show, which is data, the the one data point I would love to have is real time data on small business formation and failure. If I could ask for one data point, that's the one I would want. There's bits and pieces of it out there, but there is no consistent, reliable, deep data set on that on that issue because it's key to understanding where employment's gonna go. If there is capital to restart small businesses and that picks up as the pandemic wanes, that's great news. I don't know if that's gonna be the case because there's a lot of losses that have been absorbed in the small business community. And that, so that's the, that's the one thing I worry about and, and that we think about. Small lot. business radar is probably my next company. Yeah, that would be that'd be awesome. Uh, that I, would I be think about it all the time, and you know, I care so much about small business, and I think it's so under appreciated by both parties, and I, it could go on and on. But I, I agree with you. I think it's a, a, a one of the most important pieces of the economy, and one of the least understood. So it's, it's great to hear you say that. Yeah, sign me up as an interested supporter or a, or investor <laughs> or whatever. I, it's a it's a really important uh, uh, variable. So. The, we are actually above the mean, uh, in other words, we have toward the higher end, stronger recovery than the blue chip consensus. And ours is, uh, you'll notice I didn't use the word optimistic or pessimistic. <laughs> the reason I didn't use those words is that's, that suggests that you're forecasting what you want to happen, not what you believe will happen. And my staff is always on task to check their emotions at the door. Mm. And when we're forecasting, this is going to be what we believe will happen. We'll get wrong in one way or another anyway, but at least it's not just our attitude that's, that's driving where our forecast is. So why are we above consensus? Because of incoming data. It's, at, it's surprised to the upside consistently. And I know you guys were in the room at least two to three years ago when I said, and I've said this in many venues, that because of this supply problem in housing, the shortage of supply relative to the level of demand, the next time we have a recession, housing could very well provide a cushion on the downside. You know, the three rules of forecasting, if you give a number, don't give a date. If you give a date, don't give a number. And if you get it right, don't look surprised. So I'm, I'm leading on the third one. That has turned out to be true, that that supply issue has supported economic activity in this downturn. That's been a really good thing. But it needs a lot of help around it, primarily jobs and income growth. So we see this year, at the end of the year, national income adjusted for inflation will be about 2.6% lower than it was at the end of 2019. That's, that's the magnitude of the downturn in our forecast. Then next year, 2021, we see recapturing that plus maybe a little bit. But what that means is over a two-year time period, at the beginning of which unemployment was 3.5%, you've essentially had no growth, which if the workforce grew, unemployment had to go up. And so unemployment will be about double where it was at the end of 2019 still by the end of 2021. So that's a kind of a simple way of uh, thinking about how the pieces fit together. It may, it, it's hard to say whether it'll be above or below that. Going back to the small business question, if consumer attitudes about discretionary spend shift to different sectors, we may see higher unemployment because it's not clear that the skills of all those service sector workers are transferable into areas that the economy might turn. We don't know, but that's, that's to me a risk that's out there. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I uh, feel that one. I think that's a risk, you know, bigger picture too, just due to automation and the rest, right? Like 
everybody wants, you know, uh, you know, minimum wage to go up, but at what point does minimum wage reach a point where they replace the person with a kiosk? So exactly. yeah, machines don't get benefits, right? right, um, right. They don't need breaks and there's no SAS. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a challenge. You know, on the, the housing being a cushion, um, there was an interesting article and I wish I could attribute it. You may have read it or, or I think it was in the journal, and uh, the person basically made the uh, case that housing was a, a poor cushion because it's really consumption um, rather than savings. And, and that the dollars that are being redirected into housing and, ra- and, and increased house prices don't really provide good long-term economic benefit versus those same dollars being invested in, you know, new business and job creation and, and other things. And that housing, this, this bump in housing actually hurts our long-term uh, economic, you know, forecast. And what are your thoughts on that? Well, it is, there clearly are consumption elements to housing, I think. And, and he's right. There's a bunch of people in the housing sector that, that are kind of evangelists, if you will, for housing. It's obviously it's important, and every developed country has policy related to housing because it's one of the basic needs of of people. It's a place to live. So from that perspective, it is consumption. Um, it does create employment because as population grows, um, it it, in, it stimulates investment in related areas like construction. So it does have investment elements to it. And it also has some savings, but it element to it. But it is it's a basically a thirty year fixed rate mortgage is a forced savings plan, right? You're you're paying in, and as long as house prices don't fall, which sometimes they do, which means that your savings rate isn't what you think it is. Um, it, it it for many people it, that equity is at the end of the their working period is valuable to them as an investment. Time. But so I'm part way in the in the camp with that person, uh, and I, I'm not. I think people have to have a place to live. Hopefully, we can have decent places for people to live. Um, but uh, it's not the same kind of investment as starting a small business and employing people and that kind of thing. Is there the research that I've seen on it? It, it always. It there's a lot of arguments for home ownership and the data that they point to, they go to the stock market over that same 30 year period, but that's assuming that people are actually investing in it. I, is there any consumer research that people who are renting are behaving in that way? They're taking the money and investing it um, because the data I've seen home ownership, there's a huge wealth gap in those that own and those that don't, that would seem to squash that argument. <laughs> you, you are correct. Uh, now there are people who rent and uh, it's a lifestyle choice. It, it's not enforced economically. They could very easily buy and own homes, but simply don't care to invest their money in that way. That's a small share of, of rent or households, but it, it, is, uh, it exists. And you're absolutely right about the data on renters. And that is why when we survey renters, the biggest hurdle to renters in their mind is the down payment. Even though there are loan programs which are as low as 3% down, it is it is still the, the concern uh, of a high share of renter households that they don't have, for example, 10% or even 5% that they can pay down. And the, the um, Federal Reserve's survey of consumer finances, which they do, I, they had been doing it every other year. I think maybe now they might do it annually. Uh, is a data set that gives uh, gives clear evidence of the wealth gap between renters and owners. And, but it also gets into their assets and their liquid the liquidity of their assets as well. Um, and there's you can see why they're renting. <clears throat> Has there ever been a, any conversation about sort of the Section Eight program? Um, is there ever talk of a hybrid program to where it's almost like a lease option program where people in Section 8 would end up owning by the end if the government's going to spend money on rent to an asset that they don't own? I, I don't know. Has there ever been any discussion of that? Um, I don't know the answer to that. 
Um, it's an interesting question. I just by chance, I was reading a news article this morning uh, as I was starting work of one of the single family rental investment companies who is offering a sale and lease back option, which is a little bit along that. Uh, oh, along yeah. That. Back to sale. Yeah. Yeah. I thought I thought that was interesting. <clears throat> Uh, manufactured homes. Are you guys starting to do a lot more research on manufactured homes? Yes, that is an area which is clearly affordable housing. And we have uh, changed some underwriting rules there to uh, to attempt to support the growth in that space. Because our view is, uh, from a long-term perspective, we're probably producing less than half of the manufactured housing that uh, we should be, uh, just because it is such an affordable uh, a, a affordable form of housing. Part of that might be the availability of land in proximity to where workers who would work in that cat live in that category of housing would have to go to get to work. That and you know land obviously the first thing you need uh, if you're going to have a a, a play, building to live in is land to put it on, uh, and its proximity to. Um, transportation lines that get people to and from work that are in the income category that typically would uh, focus on affordable housing is a question. That said, we have a clear set of guidance on the quality conditions of the manufactured housing and are, are anxious to provide funding in that space. Interesting. Let's break that. Let's break that down just a little bit, right? Cause I think now manufactured housing means very different thing. We're seeing, you know, four, Million prefab homes here in Tahoe that are manufactured housing being brought in on, you know, one house being brought in on 20, 30 trailers, right, and assembled into this really amazing thing, multi million dollar property, right? So that's manufactured housing. And then at the other end, you have like mobile homes, right? So um, that's a dirty you know, they own on the <laughs> land and it's, you know, <laughs> a yeah. double wide, right? Like so, or a single wide. <laughs> so that's, that's it's a big range great. right now. That's a great point. It is, it's one of the impacts of technology that, that you can now modularize a, a property and build in a factory, you can build component parts, which can then be erected and constructed and integrated on site. So you're absolutely right about that. That is also affordable. One of the things that shocked me uh, maybe eight months ago, I shouldn't say shocked, but I was a little surprised, was Toll Brothers, which we think of as a high-end builder is doing a significant amount of that kind of building today because it's cost effective. All right. You put the you put the plants where the jobs are, and you put the houses where, you know, uh, or where or where the labor is. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, mm -hmm. and the jobs aren't. <laughs> you put the plants there, and then you put the the houses where you know there's the demand, and uh, mm -hmm. that seems to make a lot of because uh, usually in the places where you really need housing, there isn't an available labor pool to build it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's often the case. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the going to the Builder Association meetings in, in Las Vegas, this has been one of their top things that they keep talking about is the labor issue. Uh, a lot of people, I guess, just aren't going through school anymore and thinking that hard labor and construction is fun. <laughs> so um, uh -huh. maybe the manufacturing of homes, uh, it's definitely not what it used to be. So the modular, the manufacturing, and especially here in California around the accessory dwelling unit conversation and the lack of labor out here in construction, it's going to fill a really important need. Um, mm -hmm. To that point, I heard that Fannie Mae was looking at, uh, I know one of the problems in the ADU space is that uh, when you mix inventory, a stick bill with a manufactured home, um, some lenders don't like to do that. Is that on your radar, something that you guys are exploring? Um, you know, I don't know the answer to that. Um, it's not, not been in my, uh, come across my radar screen, but that's an interesting question. Um, I'd have to, I'd have to ask some of the folks in our underwriting, whether that's an issue. It just because the... Go ahead. Go ahead. I just wanted to come back to affordable housing and a little bigger picture. Like, you know, and the, the consumption savings, you know, concept we talked about a second ago. So, I mean, one of the things that has hurt affordability, right, is a lack of supply, obviously pushes prices up. Um, and, you know, 
in a lot of places where you have high prices, the the owners there want to protect those high prices by not having more things built. Right? Mm-hmm. Yep. And uh, so it becomes this kind of self-referential, uh, you know, growing thing where, okay, we as prices go up more and more, you want less and less built to protect your price gains. Um, and so, you know, we talked about earlier this, this idea that housing is consumption, it's taking money away from savings. But as prices go up, are we also taking money away and the opportunity away for new supply you know, from maybe that dynamic. And if so, it really has impacts for Fannie Mae and others. So to some degree is Fannie Mae, you know, now because they need to protect their investment, you know, and their mortgages as prices go up, doesn't everybody kind of become aligned against affordable housing despite wanting to talk about it? Right. Well, the, the, um, from Fannie Mae's perspective, we have an affordable housing mandate. In other words, we're, we're part of our charter mission is to make uh, credit av- available for uh, lower and moderate income housing. So we have that counterbalance that's actually part of our rationale. The, what you're talking about is uh, exclusionary zoning, uh, um, really, that uh, restricts development in different areas. And there's no question that that is a factor and it's part of the reason you see uh, many of the developments have a covenant that has restrictions on things that can be done within that development and it's designed in part to protect uh, valuation of properties whether they're uh, the existing valuation or rising valuations uh, to your point if if supply lags behind demand the um, there's an interesting experiment taking place in Minneapolis, which a couple of years ago rezoned everything for uh, in their metro area for more development. And, but then so they didn't do it by neighborhood because they wanted to see how the market would reallocate uh, supply, which I, I think that's going to be a very valuable experiment. Probably some of the people in Minneapolis might not like the, <laughs> like to hear that, depending on where they are in the property valuation space. But it, it from a societal perspective, um, uh, that is uh, that will be interesting to see. But you're, you're absolutely right that there is there's a natural incentive, um, and there's I'm gonna try to there's an academic who's written a couple of books on that issue, um, um, and he's sort of the reigning expert in talks about exactly that issue. The state of California is starting to take away local development control as well, like with ADUs and other things, basically to try to force, Mm -hmm. you know, to to stop communities from coming back and saying, oh no, we're going to not let you build anymore, right? So um, I I think this is going to be one of the, the most fascinating things to see how that rolls out because, you know, the wealth gap division and, you know, to your point earlier about salaried versus salary workers and the rest, I mean, it feels like it's, it's accelerating more in the last six months than mm-hmm. I can remember. You know, uh, do you have any data around that or, you know, you guys watch that wealth gap and, and some of those things? We do. I don't have anything top of mind to uh, specific numbers to give you, but yeah, yeah absolutely. Because it's, it's essential to our business, right? We need to, you know, when we underwrite a loan, it matters to us what your wealth and income uh, and credit characteristics are. So we absolutely uh, care about that. I don't, I haven't looked at something on that at, in the recent days that keeps it in my memory, but. Um, you guys ever but, talked about doing lending based on the income of the community Rather than, you know, there's these limits that are kind of, uh, you know, conventional loan limits, right, that are out there um, that try to kind of keep a cap on how, how crazy things can get on, you know, uh, the GSEs. But um, other than saying, hey, this person can afford this, right, rather than why not say, you know, for this home, for this asset, the people in this community right, can afford this much. And we're not gonna lend above that. And that seems like that'd be a way to keep prices from getting out of control versus the incomes in that 
that thing. Because one of the problems, once you have three homes that sold, supposedly every home's worth that, even though nobody in that place could afford it. Right. Well, we do have uh, maximum limits on loans that, that are established by our regulator annually, the, right. the maximum amount that we can lend against. So the, and that's been a, a source of discussion for as long as I've been in the mortgage industry about how those, should, how those limits should be set. At present, they're set annually by FHFA uh, they, in the fall of each year. In fact, it's probably upcoming. Uh, um, I don't remember the exact date. They announce whether that limit will be held constant, raised. They've never lowered it, uh, at least since I've been in the business. Um, but, and it does. there are some variations geographically. I think Hawaii and Alaska have exemptions, Puerto Rico, some things like that. Uh, and then one, two, three, and four unit properties have different uh, ceilings. But uh, we, in terms of community um, incomes, we do track that um, because it is an input into understanding house price. Uh, and so we we actually forecast house price in about 110, uh, in 100 metro areas and then 10 regional areas. Uh, and income is one of the variables that, that goes into that model. So that price would feed back against those limits that, that you were talking about to give us an idea of what business volumes might be in that market. Okay. Are you worried at all about taxation policies at the state and local levels as we deal with COVID? So I, you know, watching California, Nevada, you know, states that were very much reliant on these jobs that have disappeared, really high unemployment rates. Um, they're looking at ways to raise money because they can't turn on the cash printing machine like the Fed can. <laughs> does, does that worry you at all for specific states? Like California, will we see a migration out? Will that affect pricing? How concerned are you? Isn't it really every state though? I mean, yeah. every state has had pretty serious to make up income so somewhere. And because they have to ultimately have balanced budgets, right? Sure. Like we're going to see a lot more state and local taxes. Is that, do you think? I mean, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Well, there's, you're right. I think 49 out of the 50 states have some form of balanced budget requirement. Uh, in some cases, it might be across multiple years as opposed to within every single year. But you certainly will see uh, uh, cost cutting and you've, you've seen job loss at the state and local level of, of employment, government employment. Um, so you that that's for sure, but that there will also be an attempt to raise revenues as well. There's been of those who are involved in the municipal securities uh, uh, and bond market. There's been a lot of discussion about the need for a part of the stimulus funding at the federal federal level be to support uh, state and local jurisdictions. Of course, that gets caught up in the discussions of whether or not they've managed their pension obligations properly or not. Uh, it becomes a, a political uh, football from that perspective. But um, yes, there, uh, we don't yet have detailed research uh, on which jurisdiction's services relative to housing might have an impact on valuation. So that, but that's a, that's a researchable topic. That's an interesting question. <laughs> I feel like we're gave it, giving a whole bunch of data ideas. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's kind of the show, right? <laughs> the big local you know, taxes. Are big about data. <laughs> local taxes are, you know, income, which a lot of states don't have, income taxes, you know, sales taxes, and of course, property taxes, right? And so right. I kind of see an assault on all three being likely nationally as steel with the drop in revenue. I mean, COVID, because of the way it hit restaurants and hotels and all these things that are such strong, you know, tax components for these, you know, city, county, state uh, governments, uh, that feels to me like that's a, that's a still a pretty big headwind that's in front of us. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, the, I think there are five states that have no state income tax, uh, Florida, Texas, Tennessee, Nevada, and Washington, I think, are the five states that have no state income tax. 
So there, we're hearing, I'm living in Florida, so we're clearly hearing about cutbacks on uh, state expenditures. Um, I've not seen, except at the local level, there is gonna be some increase in property taxes at our local level. Yeah. Now, we've even heard in Nevada that there's start, starting to be talk of a constitutional amendment to bring in a state tax. Um, oh, so wow. that's interesting. So, okay, so you know th- that's one thing that I think is a headwind that's still ahead of us. What other things are still headwinds that are ahead of us that need to, that every one of us should be paying attention to, looking for data on, watching for? Well. Um... Obviously, the number one thing is a small business resurgence, whether or not we'll see that. Second thing is um, that whether there is an effective, broad-based uh, vaccine developed. So uh, because that, that eliminates fear, which is the, the primary driver of this downturn. If, if you could say tomorrow to everyone who used to go to restaurants, no problem, you have this shot. In two days after you have this shot, you can go and even if somebody with COVID shares your spoon, uh, you're not going to get sick. That completely changes the the dynamic. Now we've learned a bunch of things that might not go back the way they were. We've learned we can work remotely in many instances, uh, at least part time, uh, and so that that will maybe permanently change some things in the commercial real estate market, for example. Um, for those who are wondering what we were going to do with all these suburban houses that have five bedrooms, uh, because people are having smaller numbers of children, well, if two of them are turned into office, uh, and you may only need three bedrooms and two of them become offices, and that's a great house for you. So, you know, there's a bunch of things like that, that that we don't know. My problem with the vaccine story is my understanding is, and I I'm absolutely am not an expert in this, but I've tried to read up and see the the last or the the earliest a broad-based long-term successful vaccine was developed was the mumps and it took four years now we don't have a vaccine for SARS we don't have a vaccine for MERS we don't have a vaccine for AIDS we don't have a vaccine for Zika these these are all viral things of the common cold we don't have a vaccine for the common cold we have some vaccines for flu that are effective, partially effective for a year or, or a season. Uh, I'm inclined to think it's more likely that that's what we'll get. Um, and unfortunately, the surveys of people suggest something like 40% of people wouldn't take the vaccine even if it was available, which is a little disturbing. But that's to me, that's the number one thing that is on most people's minds and for the right reasons is what happens with vaccines. The, barring that, then the question is, how do people respond if infections pick up again? And there's some evidence that started, but maybe it's driven by the need to get back to school and some things like that, which is also a very real need. Um, uh, and so how the response uh, is, if there is a sustained pickup, uh, in infections will have an impact on whether our, our forecast is right. It, it assumes a kind of a flat behavior in, in, that, in that space, our base scenario. Um, and we're not surprised to see a little pickup because of the school question, uh, but that's another variable that, that we're watching. <clears throat> and bigger picture, I mean, we're, we're uh, the Fed balance sheet is expanding dramatically, deficit uh, spending, monetizing our own debt, all of those things are have changed radically. Are, are there headwinds that come from those, you know, fundamentally come from, from that? Or can we just print ad nauseum at this point? It doesn't matter. Well, uh, that, <laughs> there's a discussion about whether the Fed should be trying to control the yield curve, for example. Well, they are. It's not whether they should, they are. Right, how they decide to acquire treasuries absolutely has an effect on the shape of the yield curve. And they're adding eighty billion dollars of treasury uh, bonds. So uh, I think the most economists believe that the expansion, the endless expansion of the the deficit and and the debt. Uh, and today we're pretty close to where we were at the end of World War II in terms of 
debt to GDP ratio, which is awfully hard to um, to contemplate, but is that's where we are. Most economists believe that at some point that's going to lead to inflationary pressures. There's no evidence of it today, which has led to one strain of economics saying, well, the modern monetary theory group that suggests, well, it's kind of an endless game. The Fed can just monetize it. And what's the problem? Um, most economists do not believe that's an accurate reading of the, of the end game. Well, there's only three ways to fix a deficit. It's you can reduce spending. You can increase growth so that nominal, nominal growth is faster than the growth of nominal debt or some combination of the two. And right now, there's really no appetite for any of those um, in Washington, but the one that's going to get the most discussion is taxes. Um, and, you know, I, I think it was, um, I forget, one of the presidents, maybe Reagan, that said, if you want more of something, subsidize it. If you want less of something, tax it. And he had a third line on there, which I can't remember, which is, of course, the main reason I'm not president, but... Um, <laughs> isn't you know that you know and i know under modern modern monetary theory right it says you don't raise taxes until you see inflation right. and uh you just go ahead and print and then when inflation becomes a problem then you start uh taxing and i mean at this point we're we're so close to the mmt experiment like maybe yeah. just go for it yeah it's well and and the fed has it's said now they're your fate is in their hand, right? Uh, flexible average inflation targeting, F-A-I-T. So your fate is in their hand. Um, <laughs> they haven't said over what time period they're gonna calculate the average. They haven't said how far inflation might go in the short run before they would respond, even if on average over whatever time period they're thinking about, uh, it hasn't uh, met that target. Um, they've given no forward guidance on the growth of their portfolio. So there's all kinds of uncertainties, even though they've announced a new policy, there's all kinds of uh, uncertainties around that policy. And to your point, we're essentially in some form exercising modern monetary theory anyway, and yield curve control at the same time. <clears throat> we only have a few minutes left. I have to ask the question, how low do you think 30-year mortgage rates will probably end up? in the next couple of years? Well, we've, our forecast for 2021 is that they average two and three quarters percent, which means some people are getting mortgage rates lower than that, two and a half. I, uh, um, I think right now uh, people are getting um, uh, mortgage rates at two and seven eighths uh, and maybe even two and three quarters uh, today for very high quality credits. Uh, so that would suggest that the that what's going on is uh, when the COVID hit, spreads blew out uh, for several reasons. That, that in uh, 2019, the spread between the 10-year Treasury and the 30-year rate were 100, was 180 basis points on average. That blew out to over 260 basis points in the April time frame, so an 80-point widening. That has come back in to somewhere around 220 or 225 the last time I looked which if 2019 is a reasonable approximation, there's still 40 basis points to go. So if the average today is three, that would suggest it could even get uh, as low as 2.6 uh, for, for the average. We don't think it'll get quite there, but not far. If it gets there, I'm not gonna be surprised. Uh, but I remember sitting at my desk in June of 2003, I was at the Mortgage Bankers Association and I was watching the 10-year yield pass on the, on, I had a television screen which showed the market indices. And it hit 3.08 on the 10-year treasury in intraday trading, intraday trading. And I thought to myself, will I ever see a 10-year treasury rate lower than 3.08? <laughs> and today it's what, 0 0.7, I think, or something like that? Wow. Crazy. Crazy. And it seems to be lower with each crisis, right? And so mm -hmm. COVID's the latest one, but there will be another. And whether it's, you know, uh, this one was what, 12 years, whether it's two years or 12 years or 20 years, yeah. um, you know, do we end up with Japan-like rates in the 1.5 after the next one? 
Well, that's the, 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 the question to the Fed, which they have said, they have not said no, but they have said we don't want to go to negative rates. But that's the next, that's the next phase, right? They've been trying everything but that because there's no solid evidence that negative rates actually work. There's pros and cons uh, to it, but in terms of the net effect is not seen as positive, which, which is why the Fed has said where they are. Part of the problem is that the Fed is trying to do the work of fiscal policy because the fiscal policy mechanism isn't working. The problem there is that you distort price signals by attempting things which are out of the severe, out of the sphere of technical management by the by monetary policy so you get you actually get a negative in the confusion of market participants over what the real price signals are and we've always believed and i still believe that price is an indicator uh, an important indicator of things what happened in the 2007 and 2009 time period for example this is, I go back to this because it's the day, one day of my life that I will never forget. Sitting at my desk, uh, second week of August in um, 2007, and I got a call from the vice chairman of the Federal Reserve, and he said, what do you think we should do? And I, I just, even today, the hair stands up on my arms <laughs> when I remember that because it was such a frightening call. And I said to him, Governor, his name was Don Cohen, I said, I, you know, I, that uh, uh, I'm scared because if you're calling me, I'm not at the top of the power pole and it's got to be a lot worse than I thought. So I said, I, I don't know, but I do know this, that um, if you're going to, if you have a price to value something, you need a price to value something. And in order to get a price, there have to be both willing buyers and willing sellers. And today, there are only willing sellers. So I think you have to be a buyer. That was August of 2007. In October of 2008, they became a buyer, right? So right. to me, that's the, I mean, it was a simple thing. But it that's what we believe. This time, they're buying. It's, yeah, it's what we believe about the value of price, right? The problem is willing buyers and sellers. The Fed is a policy buyer. They're not an economic buyer. They're not buying for returns. They're buying to affect a policy. So if you're buying for returns, now you don't know what element of that price is a policy determined price versus a real value price. Right. That's, that's my problem with it. Wow. We're, at, we're almost out of time. One more really important question. We've been saying we're not going to see the same wave of foreclosures, even if unemployment and we have huge mortgage delinquencies, even if all of that comes to pass, we're not going to see the same wave of foreclosures because Fannie, Freddie, the Fed learned a lesson in 2008 and isn't going to dump, uh, you know, as many homes. They'll, they'll hold them. They'll work with homeowners. They'll leave the homeowner in the home not paying is my personal opinion over uh, having too many foreclosures. But I also think there will be some foreclosures because you got to keep some fear that people could lose their home to foreclosure. Otherwise, everybody stops paying. <laughs> Is well, that, am I giving people good advice? <laughs> that, I, I think you're, you're uh, on point. They, and it's not just those elements, but there's also now a group of institutional investors who buy distressed properties to turn them into single family rentals. So you have that additional cushion on the downside that didn't exist. Uh, previously. Right. And I've gotten calls from them asking, what's your price forecast? What do you think? Blah, blah, blah. So they're there. They have capital. Uh, so I think I've, there's... I think I've had right. a bunch because they all used us to you know find the foreclosures, right? And so I've had multiple calls saying, hey, we're raising a $100 million fund, a half billion yep. dollar fund. We are all in. Is your software still there to support us? And uh, I'm like, yep, we're there, but I, I don't know that you're going to get to spend it. Right, exactly. Yeah. Well, Doug, I really appreciate Good. your time. Oh, how, what, how should people uh, find uh, more about uh, the work that your team is doing? Where should they go? We have a section on the Fannie Mae website, uh, fannimae.com, 
and uh, look look for research. And our forecasts are there, the surveys of consumers, surveys of lenders, a bunch of the various research studies that we do are posted up there, and there's no paywall or anything. So, a lot of good stuff. All good you're one stuff. of my, yeah, you're definitely my uh, favorite uh, economist on all this stuff. You just take such a data-driven approach and, sure. you know, doesn't ever feel like you have a, an agenda that you're trying to, uh, to push underlying under, you know, under, you know, uh, we always joke that so many economists are, uh, 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 well, I, I, maybe that's not an appropriate joke, but uh, that they're paid to play. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I've, uh, I think I can say nobody has ever bought my voice. Uh, so we, we try very hard to, to take a, uh, a, uh, a search of truth approach to the things that we put out, even if it's bad news for us. That's yeah, really, true. really appreciate about you that about you. And <laughs> really, thank you for for coming on today. Our, our pleasure. Great seeing you guys. I look forward to us getting together in person again. Sounds good. All right. Bye, Doug. Yeah. Thank you for listening to the Data Driven Real Estate Podcast. You can find show notes and links to some of the resources mentioned in the show at datadrivenrealestate.com. Click that join the community and you'll be forwarded to the Property Radar community where you can ask questions about the current show and even see upcoming guests and ask questions there. We'd love to engage with you in the community, so check it out. Please don't forget to like, favorite, subscribe, and share on your favorite platform where you're listening to the show. It helps us out a great deal. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next week.